transition that's taking place uh, at the present time, which really began at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, really, in that sense. Um, in that sense. Uh, but of course, in a way, uh, there is a disconnect taking place, and that makes the world more complex rather than less complex. So, um, so that really, to some extent, will, will relate. Okay, now the kaleidoscope, one of the issues uh, about uh, information uh, and uh, computing, I think, <coughs> the digital revolution in that sense, that computers have brought a real dilemma to science. Traditionally, uh, we used computers to understand and predict. When I got involved in it in the mid-1960s as a graduate student, uh, we were using the Atlas I at Manchester, uh, and I punched my cards, uh, rather I punched my tape, I should say, uh, and when you punched a program on tape, basically, if you made a if you made an error, basically, you had to cut the tape, and that's it, and then stitch it back together again. You took it across to the computer center, and a day later, you got the output, basically. And models were built, really, on that basis. That's what computers were really like. You can go back a generation before that, and the way, well, the, way the programs were put in was by twisting knobs and dials, etc. Now, in some sense, most of my life, I've been working with computers to build uh, models of how transport systems work, um, how land use systems work, how urban economies work, and so on. And only in the last 10, 15 years has this begun to change. That what's really happened, and is happening, and will happen writ large over the next 100 years, is the very stuff that we're predicting and trying to understand using computers is actually going to be made of computers. So everything around us will be computers. We can see it already. Uh, somebody's taken a, a photograph of me on an iPhone, basically, that's part of the infrastructure. I'm giving you a PowerPoint, basically, that's part of the infrastructure, etc. cetera. Um, uh, if I get to that point, I'll probably click on uh, an internet link, and it'll t uh, because Edu Rome is uh, working in the college here, uh, it'll take me through to a website and so on. I can show you all of this. So to some extent, the very thing that we're trying to understand with computers is actually now being built of computers, not just computers, lots of other things too, in a traditional sense, but that in and of itself is actually problematic because the way computers are entering society, enter society, etc., is changing uh, the way we traditionally deal with material, non-computable things uh, in this context. Okay, so I can use my computer to link to many other ones, uh, across the ether, everywhere, etc. Uh, and all of this is happening to systems that traditionally are not digital, but inevitably this means um, if you introduce all of these new digital devices, uh, then we're talking about uh, a new kind of context in which the material uh, is mixing with the digital in that sense. And it's very confusing, I think. I don't think we have a clear view about how we fit it all together. Uh, and of course there are different functions in a sense. Um, I'm communicating using a computer here in that sense. That's very different, I think, from the routine functions that we might use in terms of computation as we move around and as we search on our smartphones and use smart cards and so on. So all of this is really about information flow. Vast amounts of information are flowing in different ways. And of course cities are about information to some extent. There are lots of definitions. You go back to Lewis Mumford and even before, but Jane Jacobs um, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, and then more recently Ed Glazer, both have definitions in their books about the idea of cities being where places where information flows. People come together in that sense uh, to do things using information. Now that's uh, a, a very old idea and it's very resonant, etc. Now the key issue to me is that much of the new stuff and a good deal of the old stuff is invisible. We can't see it. We can't measure it. If we can't measure it, uh, people are probably in this room now sort of uh, logged onto their phones, and I was earlier on, but uh, I assume you're logged <laughs> onto your phones, and uh, you might be sending an email, or you might be looking at a website, etc. you're parallel processing and sort of listening to me in the background, basically. But to some extent, you're doing things that make a difference, right, in some sense. Well, they may not make a difference, but we don't know. It's, it, to some extent, it's invisible. And if stuff is invisible, and we can't measure it, uh, then in some sense we can't really agree much about it, and arguably we can't really do science as it's traditionally constituted. Science demands data, facts if you like, uh, which we agree about in some sense to get going, and in some sense if much of the world is invisible, and it's getting more invisible, okay if we work for Google we can unpack what Google gets and so on, but Google is only one thing, Google can't do lots of other things 
uh, where information is being uh, 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 transitioned in, in various ways. In that sense, so let me illustrate this invisibility by posing the question as follows: Many people come to me and say, "What is the smartest city in the world? Is London a smart city? How much smarter is one city than another?" And they point to Mazda in the United Arab uh, Emirates. Uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, etc., which is a sort of smart city and so on. Well, there's no answer to that thing, because if you peel back the layers of the city, you find that the smartness, if you like, or the information, etc., the intelligence, is always there, and historically it's always there. So let's start um, in a place that, to some extent, is uh, an information hub in the centre of London, basically. Let's start by exploring the traditional city, and my walk will begin uh, near St Paul's in central London, basically, and I'll tell you about all the information that's happened uh, uh, in terms of uh, the development of the digital world over the last 200 years, etc. We're going to begin at the centre of the postcode system, EC1A, 1AA. That's the centre of the UK postcode. In fact, it doesn't exist. <laughs> but it's, it does, that particular postcode does not exist. But EC1A is the centre of the postcode, uh, and I'll tell you why. That, um, uh, we don't associate it much with the post in some sense, and the post itself uh, is all about information. But let me start, because uh, I actually live in this area, and I received a report recently uh, about the area. It's a conservation area. Uh, the report from the, uh, the uh, Planning Authority of the City of London is about how to maintain and improve the area. It's of great historic value, as you'll see in this area. Enormous development pressures on the area, Etc. And at the present time, they're thinking of they're trying in the city of London. They're trying to build what they call the Cultural Mile, which runs from the Barbican through the Museum of London, which is about to be redeveloped, and the new concert hall is going there. Basically, it's going to come through uh, this uh, this area, which I'm talking about, the conservation area, and whip round by Bart Hospital up to up to, up to Smithfield Market, which is essentially going to become another Covent Garden. Basically, the meat market is being taken away. So that's the kind of context. Uh, enormous history, most of the buildings are listed in some senses, uh, and this report was really all about this. When I got the report, which was sent to me by uh, somebody in our apartments, um, uh, by email, I should say, uh, uh, and it included a few people in the apartments who we'd never met, basically, because, you know, it's that sort of place. Um, and um, basically this came from the City of London, and. Uh, uh, it's a sort of public participation exercise in some sense. Ironically, um, the report does not mention computers or information technology once, but it was delivered to me uh, by email, and not quite. It does use Google Maps, basically, this report. But everything else is really about the quality of the environment, uh, the history, and so on. Okay, so this is where it is. It's called Postman's Park. Now, that gives you a clue immediately that we're talking about information. What is Postman's Park? Now, uh, that's a watercolour, and this is the draft supplementary planning uh, document, um, which is attached to the local plan uh, in that context. And this is the, this, this is the area of central London. Um, the, um, uh, you can see that the blocks, basically, at the top. Let me, uh, let me just point to... Uh, various things here. Okay, so you can see the blocks here, basically. So, essentially, uh, I'll tell you what these are in a moment. Postman's Park is this little pocket park here in this context. It's blown up here, uh, and this is the park itself. So, let me show you a picture of it. It's really uh, very pleasant. The corporation do a wonderful job. Uh, this is the street called Little Britain, basically, uh, and this is the park itself. Uh, this is the Namora Bank, which is the uh, general post office uh, uh, in the in the uh, 1912, it was built basically. I'll come on to that in a moment. Of course, it was sold off under the Thatcher years uh, to Nomura Bank, and Nomura Bank is trying to sell it off now again to somebody else uh, because of the financial meltdown. This is a small Georgian church in in, in in the corner, basically. So let me tell you what. Let me just uh, show you the show you what we are. We have the small Georgian church in the corner. That's Grade One listed. That's where. Uh, John Wesley and uh, his brother Charles basically sort of invented uh, Wesleyanism or Pres Pres Presbyterianism basically uh, in that particular street. Uh, the, next, uh, the next is um, the Nomura Bank. Now that's the general post office 1880 plus basically because the general post office has, has existed in this area from, uh, uh, from the 1820s or even before. 
Um, this building is uh, at British Telecom, the BT headquarters, basically. So you can see already we have a lot of information and post in this particular context. Uh, and let me give you, here's some engravings from, so that's the post office area, basically. Go back 200 years, and what you actually see is this. That's St. Paul's, just in the distance. Either side of St. Martin Le Grand and Aldersgate Street are the uh, uh, post office east, post office west, basically. Um, and this is from the, uh, the 1820s, basically, 1829, the bottom engraving. Interestingly enough, um, it appeared uh, in those days, because this was really the heart of the empire to some extent, the heart of the postal system, it appeared in those days there was a big tourist trade for people to come down to this area and watch the coaches leaving uh, the post office, basically, the stage coaches, basically, the Royal Mail coaches, which actually went out north of St. Paul's on the old A1, the Great North Road, that comes all the way down to the city at that level. Uh, and people uh, really thought this was a sport. These, 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 these things actually left the post office every 15 minutes to go to Newcastle and York and this sort of thing. So very interesting in this particular context. So really the heart of information. Now, in this context, what we might expect uh, to some extent, in terms of information, is something that might appear to be fairly obvious now, but until you know about it, if I didn't tell you any of this history, it would appear surprising. Um, I should also say that uh, Bart's Hospital is there, the redeveloped Bart's, basically, and uh, this is Merrill Lynch Bank of America. The blue building right at the centre is the Post Office Museum, the extension that Merrill Lynch bought uh, uh, in... Um, uh, the, the late 90s, and then in the financial crash, of course, Merrill Lynch got, swapped, got uh, brought by, by Bank of America, basically. Uh, and this area of, um, uh, of the City of London has become uh, a good deal hotter in the last 20 years. The new London Stock Exchange has moved up here. Uh, and this is the Central Criminal Court, which is the Old Bailey. Now, into this context, <coughs> back in um, 1896, Marconi sent the first wireless signal. Uh, now that of course led to radio uh, in this context. He sent the wireless signal from post office, uh, the post office area here basically is now the BT building, there's a plaque and I'll show you that in a moment. He sent the wireless signal across St Paul's churchyard uh, to Carter Lane which was post office south basically and then of course um, I'll, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the detail of why Marconi uh, it was an Italian actually sent it from here basically. It was a bit like Columbus going to America basically. The Italians you know, thought Marconi was nuts, basically, so he came to Britain and basically sort of demonstrated it. Um, I should say that uh, Marconi sent the first wireless signal, and of course radio began uh, in the uh, early 20th century, and of course in a way, if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, most people thought radio was dead at that point, but of course in the early 2000s they discovered Wi-Fi, and now of course we're all using Wi-Fi, basically, so this is quite an important uh, uh, an important issue. Okay, I, I just put the little black spot on there because that's Newgate, basically. That's the hanging place just outside the Central Criminal Court uh, in this context. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to rapidly, well, I do say a walk uh, from St. Paul's here all the way up to, uh, uh, to, to the beginning of the West End, along Holborn, basically. Uh, it's going to be more of a run, basically, because I'm <laughs> conscious of time in that context. But uh, essentially, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with uh, Marconi, uh, and then I'm just going to make the point that in uh, 14 years before Marconi, Edison, Thomas Edison, yes, Thomas Edison of uh, Edison, New Jersey fame, Bell Labs, the whole thing, uh, basically set up the first power station in the world was set up in Holborn, basically. Why not downtown Manhattan? Good question. Um, and I'll tell you the answer to that in a moment. And then we'll go, up, we'll go further up Holborn uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll nip into Red Lion Square where John Harrison basically built his clocks with the discovery of longitude. Uh, and then we'll nip down to King's, basically, uh, where James Clark Maxwell said it all in the 1860s. Um, and then uh, into Soho, uh, where John Logie Bird was one of the first to demonstrate television, basically. And then Faraday will go back to 1820 and electricity at the Royal Institution. And then the first internet connection outside of the US in 1972 at, of course, UCL. <laughs> so, okay, and I should say too, that into this picture, uh, just recently, a new building has opened, which is Amazon, one of the Amazon uh, uh, buildings basically in the city, uh, between the Edison power station uh, and Marconi. Um, it's an interesting question as to whether Jeff Bezos 
actually knows whether or not he cited his office actually between where Edison had the first power station and where Marconi sent the first signal. Okay, so there's a picture of the, uh, that's the BT building, the top right, and then St. Paul's Churchyard, just uh, south, of, s south of there, basically. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the plaque, basically, for Marconi uh, in that context. Let's move on. That's actually on Holden Viaduct, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Holden Viaduct, in fact, is the viaduct a little bit along from, uh, uh, the, Mar from the BT headquarters, past the Old Bailey, um, the, uh, the, the, the viaduct, in fact, is across, uh, which is Farringdon Road, basically, or the, the downstream of Farringdon Road. This is actually the River Fleet, basically. This was a river uh, until it was covered over in the 19th century sometime. So you can think of it as a raging sewer, basically, in the 19th century. So, and one of the reasons why Marconi uh, put his power station there, the first power station in the world in 1882, to, 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 to do lighting, on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the viaduct was because he didn't need to dig up the road. It was as simple as that, basically. The wires could be strung underneath, and it lasted for about four years, basically. There are other examples in downtown Manhattan, too, where, uh, uh, where he set up these power stations. Of course, of course he was uh, responsible for the electric light bulb, among uh, many, many other things. And uh, you can actually more or less trace, basically, um, uh, where this particular photograph on, on, on the left is, until I lived in the city of London, I always believed, people used to tell me that nothing had ever changed in the city of London. The change is absolutely remarkable. Even now, the change, the change is really quite enormous. Okay, let's speed on. That's the Amazon building between the two, in that sense. Uh, John Harrison, I've mentioned him. We've got Red Line Square. And then we go down, we walk down to King's. Now, James Clark Maxwell uh, discovered uh, waves wave equations, basically. These are his equations which are writ large in the physics literature. These are the wave equations. Einstein said, if James Clark Maxwell hadn't existed, there would be nothing, basically. And that's absolutely true in many senses. It was only 1860 to 61, 62 really, where he, or 65, it should say, the blue plaque, uh, where he demonstrated this at King's. Uh, he spent a lot of his time on his Scottish estate. He died very young. Um, he then went off from King's, I think, to, uh, with some break on, on the estate, he went off to, to form the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge. He didn't get a Nobel Prize because, of course, uh, uh, the Nobel Prizes weren't invented in, uh, uh, in, in the 1860s, the 1870s, basically. But uh, certainly this is a very important thing. I should say that Bush House, which is the original home of the BBC World Service, is nearby. Um, and geography at King's <coughs> and, uh, and computer science at King's, I believe, have just moved from uh, where the King's site is on the, uh, uh, on the Strand there, basically. They've just moved into Bush House, basically. So lots of interesting things in that sense. Then, very quickly then, um, uh, th here's the house in Soho that you can see where John Logie Bird first demonstrated TV. I have to be a bit careful here because... There are lots of people in America doing it at the same time. One of the key things, of course, as we know, is there's a lot of parallelism in the world in this particular context. Uh, and that's Faraday back in the, uh, in the 1820s, etc. Uh, and that's moving back up to UCL, where the first internet connection outside of the US. I'd like to weave Alan Turing into this, okay, because he's become very iconic. Alan Turing was born in Maida Vale, and the nearest I've got is that uh, he basically worked between the time when he was in Princeton and uh, uh, the war years at Bletchley Park, uh, he worked for a bit in uh, being a spy or something in the, the, the MI5 or 6 was down in Victoria in those days. Um, and uh, he also apparently collected antiques on the Farringdon Road. So that's the nearest <laughs> I've got to actually him uh, being here in that sense. Um, okay, so uh, the first internet connection outside of UCL, there's a lot of stuff missing here, of course. There's the map of the first uh, of the internet, <coughs> basically, the, the nodes basically, something like 1966, and then that's the 1972 map uh, of the internet, or the ARPANET as we call in those days, and then the link across to the satellite uh, uh, station, etc., off Norway, Norsar, um, and then the, uh, the microwave link, I think it was, to, uh, to London itself. And the, and the next one is a picture of our previous provost, Malcolm Grant, uh, giving a, a, an honorary degree, or an honorary fellowship to Robert Kahn and Vint Cerf, who were the inventors of TCIP and uh, regarded to some extent as being the, uh, the fathers of the internet. 
Okay, now very conscious of time, let me very, very quickly uh, speed up in that sense. One of the things about uh, what I've been showing you is that information is everywhere, and in some senses, um, what the walk didn't really reveal is lots of information that is mobile to some extent, using our smartphones. Uh, you only have to walk along the pavements these days to be bumped into by people uh, looking at their <coughs> smartphones and say, think of what that's meaning to some extent. Everyday reactive routine, it's changing our behavior in many different ways that we've not really been able to catalog and we can't see the impact of yet, in the sense that it's a great challenge. Uh, and it's different, in a sense, from the idea of using information in a strategic sense. Here's my little diagram of what the world looked like for a long time, for all of us to some extent. Where as theoreticians and academics and as people reflecting on the city, we're in this orange box at the bottom. In the fawn-coloured box, that's the city itself. And we interact with it by drawing data, producing theories. Into this nexus has come computers. And with computers and sensors being embedded into the environment has come real-time stream <coughs> data. So all the concern about big data is the fact that these computers and sensors are being uh, pushed into the, in, into the environment in this particular context, into the fabric of things, etc., and they're generating real-time stream data. I think Gillian, in, the, in her talk, uh, referred to the uh, Chris Anderson Wired paper which says that uh, theory is now dead, we've got all the data we ever need. Well, when you look at this real-time stream data, it's completely unstructured. All the talk about data mining at the present time is all about introducing structure to it. Uh, so in other words, you've not even started once you've got this, this data. And whether there's any structure to it or not is a big question mark in some senses. So I don't uh, have um, much truck with the idea of... Uh, real-time stream data and autonomous vehicles to some extent. I think the environment is so complex out, of, out there, basically, that it's almost impossible to get the appropriate type of data which would pertain to uh, robotic cars and things of that sort. Anyway, that's a different discussion. But nevertheless, what this is doing is changing the emphasis here in that sense. It's changing the emphasis from strategic to routine. The 24-hour city has very much come onto the agenda with real-time stream data. Urban analytics is about all the models we build in the middle, and that's really big data. Now, I don't have much time to, uh, to uh, talk about this, but let's have a quick look at uh, some of this real-time this real data. Okay, this, 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 this real-time stream data uh, and see what it looks like. Now, big data to me is, generally speaking, to do with the fact that it's being streamed in real time. The bigness comes from the fact that you switch the sensor on and the data sort of, you know, happens, basically. Oyster card, for example, in London has been um, around for about, uh, well, at least 10 years, basically. Um, and so the Oyster card development team at uh, Transport for London do have 10 years' worth of data, basically. Um, and they, don't, they won't donate that 10 years' worth of data because you'd be able to see lots of secular trends in that. You'd see tube stations going up and tube stations going down. There's a lot of political issues in, in that particular context. But this data and we have plenty of it in CASA, uh, won't fit into an Excel spreadsheet. Now, that's my definition of big data. If it won't fit into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, then you're in the, you're in the realms of uh, data mining and all that kind of stuff. Here's where it's being captured. This is outside of UCL, the, uh, uh, the quad there. And uh, um, these cameras are being changed all the time. You have to keep your eye on them, basically. But this is the congestion charging cameras. Eventually, that's going to disappear, this stuff. I think that you know, within 50 years, if these sort of things are still happening, we'll probably have sensors in the cars that actually bypass all this stuff that we can see in the environment. So it's becoming even more invisible to some extent. Uh, and here, for example, is uh, uh, the old telephone box, which is a Wi-Fi kiosk now, of course. And um, uh, then the, uh, uh, the BT Tower, basically, uh, in that context, air pollution monitors. And here, for example, another picture uh, of an air pollution monitor. I don't know where this one is, the top left, basically. And then, for example, lots of examples of where cities are being wired <coughs> in this sense, uh, where we're putting together more integrated sensors. This is taken from downtown Chicago. Uh, there's a group at um, Argonne National Labs in the University of Chicago, uh, a very powerful group uh, called the, uh, the, Data Computa uh, the Urban Computation Center, um, uh, run by Charlie Catlett, and they have a big NSF project to actually 
wire downtown Chicago. So these, these sensors have a whole variety of things within them. Uh, they're very intelligently configured, basically, so that uh, uh, Charlie and his, uh, uh, and his group, basically, uh, although this data will be in the public domain, of course, uh, are able to make sense of what's actually happening with respect to the questions they pose uh, from this data. Okay, dashboards, portals, and gateways. Um, now, there are lots of examples of this. For example, if you know Rob Kitchen in, uh, in, uh, in Maynooth, basically, his, uh, uh, he's done uh, a lot of things. I'll show his dashboard for Dublin in a moment. But these are essentially assembling lots of this open data, uh, or where it is open, where it's being streamed, basically. So this is our own London dashboard. And if you look at this, it's not sort of super intelligent, in it. it's not intelligent at all in that sense. It's just basically... Uh, a, a website with these ABIs, a, uh, APIs, which are the uh, links to the real-time data, and you can see here that we've got things like, you know, what's trending on Twitter, what the FTSE uh, 100 is, this kind of thing, uh, state of the tube trains, and so on, uh, sort of stuff that you can actually pull off. Now, that, now the mayors of cities are often interested in this because, to some extent, it's moving to give them some sense of the performance uh, of their city in that context. The uh, I'll show you the, the Dublin one in a moment, basically. Uh, but I'll show you this one just uh, uh, out of interest. Let's see if we can actually actually raise this one. Um, depending on what machine this PowerPoint's running on, we may be able to do that. So, OK, it looks like we've actually got it. So I've clicked on this. Now, this is the London Panoptica. Uh, now, that's not very good. What's happened here? Let me go to... Uh, let me go to bank and see what's happening. Ah, there we are. Okay, so now that's what's happening now, basically. Um, uh, that's what's happening now, and that is actually a bank, basically. Um, I'll pull it down to uh, somewhere I know a bit better, Bloomsbury, uh, Gower Street, etc. Uh, ah, yeah, and it looks like all the cameras, well, there's two cameras not, uh, not actually refreshed yet, but if we left it a bit, they'd be there. That's basically what's happening now. And this is the kind of stuff that's completely routine. This is done by Ollie O'Brien in CASA, who well, actually works in, in geography in Paul Longley's group. But um, uh, this is basically what's happening. Now, think about catalog classifying this data. This is not super smart data. It's just vehicles on the road. But think about uh, this happening um, in a much more comprehensive sense and software beginning to make sense of it and to count things, etc. So to some extent, this is really what's happening all the time. And it's this that we've really got to try and make sense of, in a sense, and say what's good and what's bad about it. Now, let me uh, get out of this at this point, get me back to the PowerPoint. Always tricky. Um. OK. I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Hang on. Oh, yeah, oh, no, yeah. I'm all right. Why they do this with the bloody software, you know? You know I mean, it's unbelievable. I have a Mac, basically. If I put the Mac in here, I mean, you know, that would be disaster because um, uh, on a Mac, they've changed the PowerPoint, so that's a lot. Change the PowerPoint stuff massively. I've just got to get back to my. Yeah, that's lost my mouse now. Slideshow, and then you do. Yeah, you're there. Can you see my mouse? I can see the zoom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to be in there? Yeah, I know, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, resume, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got, got, got rid of that one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay, so uh, what we've got here is a, a bunch of slides that really pertain to the, the kind of control centres that are pretty routine these days. And what you're seeing is the London Traffic Control Centre at that point. Uh, the next one, I hope, when uh, Nicola is able to do this, uh, takes us in. Oh, hang on. This is worse than usual.
Just escape. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, we're okay. Right. We're up. Okay, so let me quickly. It's a bunch of slides here that simply show the, what these control centers look like. Uh, this is sort of relevant to what's been I I said in a number of times at this conference that uh, Rio de Janeiro have this big IBM control center. Okay, a lot of critique of that, basically, for all sorts of reasons. But nevertheless, it does do. It does look at hazards, uh, essentially, of uh, flooding, etc., uh, in the city. Um, and this is a slightly more intelligent one. This is the Rob Kitchen one I was mentioning, uh, basically the Dublin dashboard in this particular context. And why I say it's a bit more intelligent, there is some analytics here that um, the Amsterdam dashboard is particularly good too because it has things like house prices, unemployment, uh, things of that sort. So this is really what's beginning to happen, taking some of this real-time stream data, basically. Okay, the real-time stream data, when you move to socioeconomic type data, such as house prices, is slightly more problematic, but nevertheless, if you look at some of these sites like Right Move, Tuplo, and so on, um, uh, Prime Location, they are refreshing on a, a daily basis with a lot of sales coming on stream. So uh, we are talking about stuff that uh, traditionally we've always thought of. We produce at cross sections of time, etc., uh, uh, put into the kind of real time context. So intelligence is being introduced. Now let me spend five minutes and then finish, uh, exactly, <laughs> like I said five minutes, just on our Oyster Card project very quickly. So basically, the Oyster Card, which is the, is the smart card, many of you know about it, uh, most um, transit systems, public transit systems, have smart cards of this kind. Now, it's accepted at 695 underground uh, rail stations and on uh, underground and uh, overground stations, and it can, it can, it can even be accepted on network rail, on, on national rail, uh, within the boundary zone, basically, up to the boundary zone. Uh, and it's on thousands of buses. So it's a, it's a very widely used card. About 85% of people traveling on the network uh, in London are using the card in that sense, unlike Singapore and Hong Kong and so on, uh, where their cards are actually used to buy things as well from shops and so on. Uh, this is very much restricted to transport London. Now, we have a data set with 991 million Oyster card taps, basically. You tap in and tap out, so each one is, is separate. Taps over the summer of 2012. The reason why Transport for London gave me this, that they were very interested in whether the system was going to cope with the, with the, with the Olympics in 2012. Uh, it did, it coped admirably, partly due to the fact that everybody was told to go on holiday, basically, in London at that point. Anyway, we, we've looked at that data extensively, um, and we're able to do a number of things with it. Um, the, uh, in particular, this is the, this is the overground and national rail networks where Oyster cards can be used. It's not normally a picture you see. You normally just see the tube network uh, extracted, basically. So it's quite complex, a bit like Tokyo, Manhattan, and places in that sense. Um, uh, let me just move on in that context. Here are some pictures of things that we've done with it. That's John, uh, John Reed from King's, but at the top uh, right-hand corner, who basically put this stuff together. Uh, and these little slides, we have an animation that show you that from this data we can piece together where people tap in and where they tap out. We use some software to work out what is the most likely journey they make because if you tap in at Good Street and you tap out at Westminster, say, we don't know which way you've gone, basically, and it depends on how well you know the system, uh, etc. And it also uh, it depends on a whole range of things, such as cognition within the tube stations themselves. So there's a lot of issues relating to the data itself. So it's a good data set, it's perfect in many senses, there's no, uh, there's no loss of data, etc. But actually that's not quite true, there is loss of data. Uh, the guys in CASA gave me um, one day's worth of Oyster card data to look at. In, in fact, it wasn't from the 2012, it was from 2010. They gave me a Monday, November uh, uh, 2010, and um, they gave it me in an Excel spreadsheet, right? Because they know that I can't use all this fancy stuff. So uh, I'm just a messenger. So they gave me this data, and one of the interesting things is that 6.2 million people tapped in, and 5.4 million people tapped out. Now the tube closes for two hours. It used to close for two hours. Okay, so what happens to the 0.8 million, right? Well, of course, what happens is, um, the reported the barriers open, right? The barriers are open, and if, for example, um, you have a season ticket, you've paid so much for a week, 
Or if, like me, you've got a freedom pass, i.e. a bus pass, you know, um, best bus pass in the world, by the way, sort of live in central London, 11 in London, resident. Anyway, um, if you have a pass, uh, then basically you don't need to use it. I mean, strictly speaking, you're told to actually tap onto the other, uh, the other thing uh, if, for example, the barrier is open. You, you, you have to validate. it. good example is City Airport, for example, it doesn't have a barrier, basically. If you actually come down from a bank to City Airport, uh, and you don't tap out, then they will charge you the maximum maximum fare, basically, to zone six. That's basically it. So, in other words, the data is not perfect. Great swathes of it were missing in that sense. And so these are the kind of issues that really pertain to big data. And the big data from the Oyster card stuff is really very good compared to most. Now, I just want to show you this is um, uh, the kind of thing we do. I just want to show you this thing. This is actually four tube stations. Uh, and, of course, it's showing you the... Uh, the, uh, the pluses and minuses during the peak. You have, you have time, the 24 hours on the horizontal, and you have um, uh, a convention for representing in and out flows. You can, see the, uh, you can see the peak out in the bottom left, which is bank station. I always ask the audience, what is the station, this is very appropriate for today, by the way, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the station on the top, the, the, the top, uh, top right? Now, that's the station where um, we've clearly got some big events going on. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, tell you what it is, it's the Arsenal, right? Highbury. So this is Highbury, and this is the, uh, uh, the midday Saturday game, and the other Saturday game, and then the, uh, uh, this one is the uh, midweek game, basically, in the terms of the data. I say that it's very relevant today because Arsene Wenger has just, uh, has just resigned as, a, as, a, as a, a manager of Arsenal, basically. And of course, that came through. So, that, you know, if you'd have been here 20 years ago, that would have probably, you probably wouldn't have got that news until, uh, you know, for five hours or 10 hours or tomorrow, etc. in that sense. So, uh, so anyway, so these are, and, and you can see that this gives a very rich profiling of this particular data. Now, I'm very conscious about time. I know Michael has to do. Let me go very quickly through some of these things. We've done the same sort of work in comparing Beijing, um, Singapore, and, um, and these are the three subway systems in question, looking at disruption in this particular context. Uh, we have a variety of work looking at disruption. So here, for example, is um, uh, this is a, a case where the circle and district lines were closed for about four hours. Now, that really is a long closure back in our 2012 data set. Um, and what we're able to compute in this sense is the displacement on the network. We're able to compute this displacement of where people travel longer, uh, they divert to buses and so on. So we're able to look at that kind of disruption. What we can't do yet, and what we'd really like to do, is to tie this demand data, because the tap-in, tap-out data is demand, with the supply data. The supply data is the trains data. And of course, uh, London Underground basically have very detailed uh, logging of where their trains are at any point in time. We'd like to tie up, when somebody taps into a tube station and goes down to a train, we'd like to know which train they get on. And that is very important for disruption because, you know, if I go down and I get on a train and the train has been disrupted further up the line, basically, I don't see any of that disruption. It's the passengers on the train that have seen the disruption. Um, also, of course, in the tube stations are very complex inside. Bank, for example, is an absolute nightmare uh, in terms of trying to find the, the way to the documents like right railway. Um, so in other words, we want to try and tie all of this stuff, demand and supply. That's a big issue because transport for London, of, you know, you go down there and say no photographs in the tube, you know, no Wi-Fi no wi uh, tracking people is allowed. I don't know how they control for that, basically. Uh, they're only experimenting with their own Wi-Fi at the moment. So lots of issues related to, you know, what is, what is possible in that sense. Now, just very quickly to finish, um, social media. Um, we are, uh, like many groups around the place, uh, thinking about how we use tweets and uh, social media of various sorts, plotting it. Lots of problems in terms of representation and so on. Um, uh, relevance at that level. Here's an example of urban vitality using that. We've looked a bit at Airbnb. One of our students is looking at the impact of Airbnb on property values, etc., and so on, and looking at the relative uh, distribution in London and San Francisco. Uh, air pollution, all of these things, very routine in many sense. Uh, the King's Group have done a lot of work on, on air pollution. They run the GLA uh, or the, the London wide uh, 
uh, site, um, uh, Frank Kelly does, and we've done a lot of work on visualizing this kind. So, so that gives you a taste of what's going on. A tiny taste, really, because there's lots and lots of things uh, in a way going on. Now, I made the point at the very beginning that to some extent, uh, if, we can't, if we can't put it together, and a lot of it's invisible, what I've shown you is the visible bits. If most of it's invisible, how can we then begin to think about the impact on the city form? And traditionally, uh, intervening in cities is to change the form, you know, <coughs> controlling urban sprawl, green belts, all that sort of thing. Not so different these days from what it was. So to some extent, this is, this is the kind of mismatch that we actually face. And so in a way, uh, the notion of what the city is going to be like uh, in 50 or 100 years' time, well, it's always been, we've never known what it's going to be like. I mean, we can't predict the future, basically, in that sense. But nevertheless, the, the important point is, to some extent, uh, that by thinking of the city as a kind of information processor, rather than a smart city in this context, whatever smart means, etc., in a way, but thinking of it more in terms of the information city, a bit like what uh, Steve Graham and Simon Marvin have done in the past, and uh, thinking and Rob Kitchen <coughs> now, and thinking of it in those terms, I think is a much more fruitful analogy, uh, in some sense, to begin to think about how we might make progress in this great morass of information that's really besetting us. Old idea, I'd say, but it, it makes it, it, it makes us think. Okay, so let me just credit one or two of the people who helped me. Okay, thank you. Well, that's, that's fantastic. If you if you forgive me, uh, I'm going to suggest we're running slightly late, so we might actually um, cap the questions at, at zero for yep. the discussion. If you're okay with that, yeah. and um, you'll have a 20-minute roundup for myself, which um, will be abbreviated to about 30 seconds. So, um, all, all that I wanted to do very quickly is just to remind you that uh, first of all, a, a logistical thing. Um, people signed up to lunch or didn't uh, sign up to lunch. The nature of these things is there is a bit of a dropout. Um, that means that we have paid for a number of lunches. If anyone wants lunch who is in this room, please say. If you are dropping out from lunch, and you please could you tell Nathan on the way out of the, of the, of the, of the meeting. If you want lunch and you haven't signed up for lunch, you want to come along, but so please tell us so we can make sure the numbers are right. Much more interestingly, there's really a, just a thank you to everybody, every, all the speakers who came here, um, making a fantastic uh, contribution to what we hoped would bring together a, well, Walter Benjamin talks about uh, constellatory epistemologies, which uh, I guess probably sums up um, some, something about where, where one gets, comes from when producing such a collection of people. And this, that's, I think, the spirit and the effort in which everyone has engaged is very much appreciated. There are more specifics, though. There are some very um, key thanks which I would like everyone to acknowledge at, at the end of them. Um, uh, not anybody in this room, but some academics are quite hard to handle. Um, <laughs> the metaphor of herding cats occasionally comes to mind. Um, there has been a huge amount of work uh, put in by um, the admin team at the Central Migration Policy and Society Compass. So, Emma Newcomb, Michael Van Maas, Nathan Gracie in, in particular. There are also um, within Oxford the, the group of the network of graduate students around the urbanists uh, also made a, a great work, great help in putting the conference together. Uh, within, within, uh, within Oxford itself, there's a team who've been working with um, uh, transformations, uh, Igor Calzada, Nicola Hedlum, um, also were, were there. And I guess in particular, uh, we have had, and uh, Peter Grant, sorry, I'm going to get Peter, I'm going to make sure I don't forget anyone. Peter Grant, who people have seen at, at, the, at the door, I'm just looking for my on anybody at all. But one person, um, or two people actually, Nick Simchikaresi, who can't be here today, was one of the main two organisers of the conference um, who did all the real work in all of this. But um, in particular, uh, people have noticed in the correspondence, in the goodwill, in the calmness, in the face of my uh, hopeless uh, panic and of inability to read uh, paperwork. Uh, the person who did most work was Andrea de Santos. So, Please, as I say, the lunch is 
about five, uh, five, six minutes away in on Walton Street. We'll be walking in that direction. And there's a, uh, <laughs> 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 I know people have trains, planes, other forms of uh, perambulation to kind of get, get home. So if you can get to lunch as reasonably quickly if you're coming. And if you're not coming, please tell somebody. And if you want to come and you haven't signed up, there, there are certainly spare places for lunch.